A pleasant good afternoon to everyone watching us live on Zoom and Facebook. And welcome to this edition of SEMAP Live, Innovation Spotlight on Women in the Supply Chain. I am Ana Rose Ochoa, Program Director of SEMAP, and I will be hosting this afternoon session. This is the second of our Innovation Spotlight series, presented in partnership with the UP Public Administration Research and Extension Services Foundation, Regulatory Reform Support Program for National Development, or UPAF Respond. Once again, we will focus on how supply chain stakeholders innovated to adapt to the disruptions caused by the pandemic and to prepare them for the new normal that lies ahead. This time, we will be focusing on how women across Philippine supply chain have worked to connect businesses, particularly female entrepreneurs during this time. It is a time to celebrate and recognize the achievements of women in our industry. As a past president of SEMAP, I have seen the firsthand the critical role we play in making our businesses competitive and delivery for our customers and partners. This role is more critical now as more barriers to entry come down thanks to the advent of e-commerce and new technologies. Today, we will hear from three of the women playing leading roles across our supply chain. One, from the new breed of logistic players, one from the many female entrepreneurs in the country, and one seasoned practitioner and leading leader in the supply chain industry. But we will begin with a few words from our partners from UPAF Respond. Please give a warm welcome to Rafael Rivera, Respond Deputy Team Leader. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Ms. Archie. I uh, will be Presenting a very quick uh, PowerPoint so that we can already start with the main agenda for this afternoon. So, on behalf of our chip of party, Dr. Enrico Basilio, and uh, our team leader, uh, Dr. Gilbert Yanto, um, again, my, my name is Rafi Rivera, one of the deputy team leaders for the Respond Project. And my task for today is just to introduce to you the Respond Project and the supply chain analytics activity, especially for the uh, first timers for this uh, webinar. So RESPAN stands for Regulatory Reform Support Program for National Development. It is a project being implemented by the UT Public Administration Research and Extension Services Foundation. It's a partner foundation of the UP and CPAG. It's a USA grantee that, uh, and the project has a life, life cycle of uh, five, year, five years, which started last 2019. The overarching goal of our SPAN project is to make the environment for trade and investment more open and competitive. And we have three objectives to uh, help us now achieve this main uh, goal. So objective one is to enhance market competition by reducing barriers to market entry and uh, regulatory burden and transaction costs. This objective is being spearheaded by Dr. Mario Lamberte. Objective two, on the other hand, is strengthening regulatory capacity and governance through uh, enhancing regulatory oversight, transparency, and accountability mechanisms. This one is being spearheaded by Dr. Lianto. And a cross-cutting objective is to engage more citizens and advocate you know, for uh, policies that will make uh, the trade and investment environment more open and competitive. So response uh, embraces the whole of nation or whole of society approach. So as you can see, we work with uh, as much as possible the, all the concerned government partners in the, our uh, uh, project areas. At the same time, the private sector partners. So this uh, SCAN webinar is a classic example of that, uh, working side by side with the private sector partners to help our government partners, especially in uh, formulating policies that will address, uh, let's say, the area of uh, supply chain. These are a summary, no? this is not exhaustive, but it's a summary of what we do in relation to supply chain. So uh, we are working primarily with uh, the anti red tape Authority and the Department of Trade and Industry. So we are work, you know, our activities can be uh, categorized into two. On one hand, we work on uh, policies no? such as uh, uh, the JMC on suspending the LGU pass through peace. And recently, no, we signed the JMC on guidelines of the classification 
different certification and safe handling transport of coconut shell products. We also we are also active in working uh, with DTI in uh, in the passage of the House Bill 10575, which will further enhance our maritime industry. We are also working closely with them in the updating of the National Logistics Master Plan. In, in this area, we are also working with the Supply Chain uh, Management Association of the Philippines because uh, they are key partner to this uh, master plan. And uh, recently, we also participated in facilitating the shipping service between the Philippines and the U.S. through the Irish shipping companies. We also work with the different system and applications, like for example, the Unified Logistic Pass, the ARTA dashboard, and the uh, recently launched also the ARTA Citizen Services app. For the supply chain, and particularly with uh, our uh, technical systems of UTI, we work with the scan dashboard and mobile application, as I will discuss later. We also work with them for the transport and logistic cost models. And uh, more recently, we're all working closely with DTI in upgrading and enhancing their e show platform. The SCAN, as a short for supply chain analytics, it's a dual system. It's always been a dual system, a flexible dual system. On one hand, you have a data collection mobile app, and the data that will be collected from this mobile app will be fed to the uh, dashboard that will help our policy maker, our decision makers to uh, uh, in making you know, timely and relevant decisions, especially during the pandemic. The video that you showed, you know, uh, that was played before the official start of the program talks about the uh, the first stage or the first phase of scan. With this system, we complement this mobile app and dashboard with webinars and consultations like we are having right now. And the ultimate goal is to provide relevant inputs to our policymakers in, uh, in, in ensuring that there will be uh, unfair movements of goods and services, especially during uh, the pandemic and other uh, disasters or crises in the future. So there are two phases of scan. As I said, uh, it was this is uh, uh, an initiative, an effort that was uh, form, formed during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then uh, opportunity when the uh, condition improves, we, we don't really need the scan for the uh, COVID-19 related activity. So we re-engineer it to what we are using it right now, as I will discuss later. So this is the phase one of the scan dashboard. So as you can see, it is uh, composed of different data, secondary and primary. The primary data are gathered via the uh, mobile app that you, show, that you saw a while ago. It's a free app that can be installed in your uh, cell phones, in your mobile gadgets, whether you're using Android or iOS powered gadgets. And uh, it allows an ordinary citizen to immediately report uh, um, um, incidences, no? especially during the pandemic. And the data that were gathered during this from this mobile app, as I said, were fed to the dashboard that can be that are that is visible to the uh, members of the IATF for uh, that uh, helps manages the uh, pandemic. Uh, early 20, uh, starting 2020 up to uh, early last, last year. So we, uh, we donated no, and we turned over the first uh, phase of scan to uh, Cabsec Magrales, who was the co-chair of the IATF. And uh, after that, there were several uh, modifications based on the comment from Cabsec, comments from other uh, stakeholders. So we continued uh, working on by uh, updating the scan platform. We also had uh, webinars like this. So when we started scan, we held, we organized eight webinars all in all. So the webinars focus on uh, key topics, key issues that uh, relate to supply chain. And the uh, results of these webinars are shared to our government partners so they can be also. Uh, so we can also provide them no, with the timely inputs and relevant inputs, especially in uh, making sure that the movements of goods and services are, uh, are seamless during the time of the pandemic. So now, we, as I said, no, as the conditions uh, improve, so we uh, reorient the purpose of SCAN. It, it, uh, it 
So it uh, also shows no, how flexible this system is, no, even if we're already not focusing on the pandemic related issues, we were able to use this to further provide technical assistance to our uh, government agency partners. So you can, as you can see on the top left is the PNP Contro Group. So this the scan now also serves as an info dashboard for this, in, for this uh, uh, private-led initiative no, in support of the government program of Zero Hunger. At the same time, we are also using SCAN for the e-pressure. No? This is with DPI, so the e-pressure will allow, uh, the, the high, the vastly improved e-pressure will allow consumers to check and to be uh, informed of the latest and most upgrade prices of uh, basic and prime commodities. This is important, especially during the disasters or crisis, when there is a tendency for the prices of the basic goods and services to uh, to jump excessively. So in order to avoid that, and in order to uh, make our uh, ordinary citizens informed about the most accurate available prices in the market, we are helping DTI to make this uh, system uh, function better and serve our uh, citizens much uh, more efficiently. So this is the app. Uh, it will be launched soon, uh, sometime in May this year. And again, it will be available in Android and uh, uh, iOS gadgets and it's for free. You can download it uh, for free later now once it's officially launched. And you can check the uh, prices of basic and prime commodities uh, as uh, monitored by the Department of Trade and Industry. So it improves in the transparency and accountability, accountability, accountability mechanism particularly of the prices, which we, which we know it's a very uh, key element of the supply chain. We also help ARTA on the uh, Unified Logistics Pass. So this, uh, this one is to allow uh, seamless movement of trackers you know, going around uh, the zone and, then, or, and eventually different parts of the country. So this, uh, this aims to streamline documentary requirements in the logistics sector so that we can ease the regulatory burden brought, brought about by a redundant requirement. This is an ongoing system. So we are pilot testing this with select uh, port sites, but the goal is hopefully we can, uh, uh, we can have it, no? uh, all trackers to use this so that the, uh, it will minimize delays, unnecessary delays in the movement of our goods and services. And uh, similar to uh, phase one of SCAN, we also organize, uh, we, are, we again organize uh, webinars. And uh, on last December, we had our first for uh, the webinar 2.0. So as I mentioned by Ms. Ochi, it focuses on the innovation uh, spotlight on the web. Uh, on, uh, on last December, it focuses on the beverage industry. And for this, for today, this will be the main agenda. No? So the, as mentioned already, the topic will be on the women in the supply chain. So with that, I end my presentation and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to the deputy team leader of RESPOND, Rafi Rivera, for that update. Before we continue, we'd like to remind everyone watching us to submit your questions through our chat box or the Q&A section. We will get to them at our open forum later at the program. Now it's time to hear from our featured speakers this afternoon. Our first speaker is the Managing Director of Lala Move Philippines. She previously worked as the Operations Manager overseeing day-to-day -day driver operations. She also previously worked with various technology firms such as Groupon, Globe Telecom, and Mint the company behind Gcash. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round of applause to Ms. Dana Maharokan. Thank you so much for having me today. It's very exciting to see you all, albeit virtually. Hopefully in the near future, we can all do this in person. So very, I'm also very excited to share with you guys um, all of the things that we've managed to achieve over the past couple of years, especially amidst the pandemic um, and how we, Lala Move as a company has managed to support the whole supply chain ecosystem um, 
with all of our partner drivers, all of the MSMEs we have been able to empower. Um, just to share with you guys in the theme of, you know, having women in business, women that's driving um, the, the ecosystem, um, Lala Move is actually comprised of 70% uh, females. Our management team is also comprised of the same percentage. So, um, with that, I'm very excited to share with you all of the things that we have managed to do to support our communities over the past few years. All right, next slide, please. Okay. Lala Move along with our MSMEs, our partner drivers, have thrived and survived amid the pandemic. Um, I think in 2020, there was a lot of talk surrounding how we survived this, right? But logistics companies, companies that provide on-demand delivery services such as Lala Move, have actually not just managed to survive, but also to thrive and grow amidst the pandemic. The, the challenge that we were faced was actually um, transitioning from what was the norm previously, which was brick and mortar, right? In order for us to move towards online, um, despite the community quarantine restrictions and health protocols in place, um, we needed to act fast and um, we needed to maintain a solution-based approach to help us continuously provide livelihood programs for um, for people that were uh, that lost their jobs, for people that needed to shift to online selling or uh, having their own you know uh, small business, right? Um, when people stayed home, we were there to be able to move their goods outside, right? Um, the global health crisis really highlighted the backbone of the pH economy. And this, these are really our small, medium enterprises, as well as our very own partner drivers. While majority of us stayed home and stayed safe, our heroes on the road were out delivering all of these goods. And, you know, um, this was the, the, the amount of partner drivers we have are actually comprised of um, male and female partner drivers. We actually do have a lot of female motorcycle drivers, which we are very, very proud of. So regardless of gender orientation, we, we were really able to keep the economy afloat during these challenging times. So as a digital company, our strength was and continues to remain to be innovation. And this is something that has allowed us to um, move towards the pandemic and will allow us to continue to grow, even as we face what is now the new normal. So how did Lala Move survive? and aid our economic frontliners, right? So in 2021, um, Lala Move launched multiple service types, additional vehicles um, moving from sedan, SUVs, um, what we were previously known for before uh, 2021, or 2020 was actually our motorcycles as well as our small trucks, which would be, you know, your L300s, H100s. But over the past two years, we have been launching additional service types to allow our users to have have more access to varying vehicle types, again, to move their businesses. But at the same time, this also provided more livelihood opportunities for displaced workers, right? So people that have lost their jobs but have a vehicle, be it a motorcycle, a sedan, etc., were able to earn during this difficult period. Um, but at the same time, we knew that it wasn't just a matter of helping areas that we were currently in at that time. So in 2020, we were only in Manila and Cebu. Um, and during that period, to this day, we continue to expand. So as of today, we are actually now occupying the entirety of the Luzon Island. Um, last year, 2021, we launched in Pampanga. So anyone who lives in Pampanga can actually now book motorcycles all the way to large trucks. But as of today, you can now book from Manila all the way to Ilocos, all the way to Bicol. And I don't think anyone would have ever thought that you can use on-demand delivery to go all the way to the ends of Luzon. Right? We also partnered with a lot of NGOs, a lot of groups to be able to do CSR activities, again, with the goal of helping the lives of the communities that we serve. So one example is Bounce Back PH, where we launched the Deliver Care program. Um, this helped MSMEs. This also helped partner drivers. The beauty of what we do in Lala Move is that um, we are able to support not just, the, uh, not just consumers, but we are able to support MSMEs. We are also able to support partner drivers. So every time we are able to do a CSR program, this actually hits multiple community groups. Oops. Right. Next. 
we also synchronize safe handling of packages uh, with, a, with in partnership, not just with NCRPO, but also with PIDEA and other varying government agencies in order to continue to promote the confidence that people may have with on-demand deliveries. Um, of course, core to Lala Move is it, its partner drivers. So even prior to 2020, we've always had a de dedicated arm trying to look into additional partnerships to provide benefits to our partner drivers. But during this period, one of the most critical points um, of concern would be on health. And we have a lot of great, great partners such as MaxiCare, such as Generica, that have generously provided very, very good discounts to our partner drivers to let them be more confident as they support our economy, um, but know that they will have the support in, in, in the event that they do get sick. Right? We also encourage partner drivers to get vaccinated through the Lala Ligtas initiative. This is actually one of my most favorite programs here in Lala Move because this really encouraged our partner drivers to get vaccinated. There was a lot of apprehension on vaccination last year. And um, we knew that bombarding partner drivers only with infographics may not be able to make as much of a dent as it should. So we tried to create a holistic program that not only gave them the right information to make an informed decision, but also to encourage them by giving them fun programs and incentives in order for them to truly be vaccinated and again, to always, always promote safe deliveries. So this year, with um, Distance On Demand, we saw an opportunity for us to uh, further our uh, to further support our economic frontliners, which are our partner drivers and again, our MSMEs, right? Next slide, please. So just imagine or just think of walking distance, right? People say that, okay, I'm going to go there because it's walking distance. This is something that we really aspire to be able to do with deliveries. We don't want people to think that if I have to do deliveries, it has to take three days, seven days, 30 days. This is something, deliveries can now be walking distances. In the, at the tip of your fingertips, all you have to do is whip out your home and your deliveries can walk the distance. So this is the very word that we aim to redefine in terms of all the services and the innovations that Lalamu was able to do. Next. All right. With Lalamu's um, part in the supply chain of the country, we want to empower the Philippine market to truly go the distance as we brand ourselves here, as we continue to grow the brand rather in the country, we want to continue to push boundaries, to continue going the distance. As I mentioned earlier, initially we were um, only in Manila as well as in Cebu, and now we are all the way to Pampanga, all the way to the ends of Luzon, and we're not stopping there. We are going to continue going the distance in order to further support more Filipino communities in the country. Right. So anywhere you are, whether you're in Cebu, Quezon City, Manila, Bulacan, Pampanga, now Ilocos, um, La Union, anywhere you can think of in Luzon, you can now book a Lala move. deliver Who is it, Alex? At your service. Let's Lala move the distance. distance. Lalamove's expanded coverage, we can get your shipments to more locations. Reach across the zone in Cebu whenever you need it. Just, Just Lalamove move the distance. Lalamove. Can you mom deliver? All right. So as we continue to Lalamove the distance, we have been able to support over 10,000 registered businesses. This doesn't even count all of our MSMEs that are just starting out and are in the process of having their businesses um, registered. We also have been able to support over 200,000 professional partner drivers, and we are able to support over 5 million deliveries every single month. And um, this is something that we will continue to do. This is something we will continue to grow. So as I close today's discussion, I think this is something that will make our audience very happy. As we promote continuing to Lala Move the Distance, here are some treats for you guys. You can take a screenshot or take a photo of all of the great deals that we have over the remainder of April. Thank you so much, everyone, for having me again today. And um, I look forward to any questions you guys may have later. So PSA, deliver more <laughs> with all of these promos. Thank you, guys.
Thank you very much, Dana, for that very insightful presentation and for us to know more about Lalamu. Okay, so for our next speaker, uh, she's one of the many female entrepreneurs who are making their mark in the country. She's the co-founder of JG Superstore, formerly known as Juan Gadget, one of the country's top electronic retailers. She previously worked in various marketing, sales, and finance roles, and also published The Food Scout, an award-winning travel and lifestyle blog. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Jill Tan. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me here. Um, it's really a privilege to speak to a lot of you. So I'll just be sharing more about, um, I call it my firstborn or our first baby with me and my husband. So it's JG Superstore. So JG Superstore, for those of you who likes to shop in e-commerce and Shopee, Lazada, um, I hope you saw one of our, if, I, saw, I hope uh, one of our products um, attracted you like our batteries camera accessories and some work from home products so who is jg superstore so um, we started in 2016 we are in the business of wholesale and retail distributorship dealership of various photo video audio studio equipment and accessories industrial and measuring devices and all other innovative gadgets so before we were called as one gadget but we rebranded recently, a um, few years, a uh, few months ago to JG Superstore. So here are some of our products. So we have camera accessories like lenses, um, podcasting products, audio related cam um, computer accessories, Instax cameras, Fujifilm, um, musical instruments, and so much more. So... That's also one of the reasons why we branded from one gadget to JG Superstore. But before that, um, I'll share first what is our vision and our mission that led us to here right now. So our vision is to be the number one favorite retailer of the Filipinos for consumer electronics. And our mission is to inspire a life full of passion, purpose, and happiness to every Filipino. So just a quick background about, <clears throat> about JG Superstore. So before we were called as one gadget, it started when um, my former boyfriend, uh, we were an engaged couple. At that time, um, we were having dilemmas and finding camera accessories because I love taking photos. It's one of my passions 10 years ago. Uh, that's why I also started a food blog. So I like taking photos. I enjoy um, dining in restaurants and just um, publishing and printing a lot of good photos. And one of the problems that we encountered was we had uh, a difficulty finding camera accessories that are accessible, uh, reasonably priced, and has good after sales and also that offers a lot of varieties. Since uh, me and my husband loves to travel, we saw a lot of products in during our travels that we cannot find here in the Philippines. So at that time, Sakta then we were engaged. So we were thinking, you know, how are we going to survive or how are we going to um, enjoy our life as husband and wife? So um, it was also a blessing in disguise and a sign from God to to dive into this business that started as a hobby at first. So at that time also, um, when we were looking for camera accessories, we had to go to places that are not safe for us. Um, we had the difficulty finding parking slots and so many um, challenges in finding those products. So we decided why not offer these products that we know and we're very familiar to the Filipinos. So it was also perfect for both of us. But if you need a different to be probably in marketing, sales, um, human resource, and shanaman and more on the back end operations, supply side. And basically we really worked well together. And a lot of people were actually discouraging our the best to maybe older people that partnership would really be a challenge so 
for us um and yeah so we decided to, to jump into that okay um uh, next slide please hold on i think i disconnect see so i'll be doing the slides for a bit hold on okay you can continue the language Okay, so just to add, so it started in 2015, and then 2016, we officially uh, launched our first baby, which we call Juan Gadget at that time. So now we rebranded to JG Superstore since we, we felt that the name Juan Gadget doesn't really uh, portray the brand anymore. It's very different from how we started five years ago. So there, and next slide, actually, I want to share with you how we survived and thrived in the midst of pandemic. So we, as I told you, we started in 2016 and for a young company, a very young and toddler company during the 2020, during 2020, during the pandemic was a very difficult season for us. Well, it was a challenge, not only for us, for sure, but for everyone else. So to be in that position, that timing was really, could be discouraging and could, um, it was really a crucial moment for us to make decisions. But one of the things that um, 2020 pandemic taught us was really opening and being open to a lot of opportunities. Um, as I said, the company started with just the two of us. So financially, you know, it's really easy to make decisions if you are, if you have a lot of uh, resources, if you are financially stable and you can really um, support yourself or all the employees. But for a young company like us, for a Filipino young company, and we don't have foreign investors or um, local investors, it was really a bold move and tough challenge for us, for a young Filipino company. But I want to share with you what were the challenges that we encountered and what did we do for us to survive? Not just survive, but to thrive during the pandemic. Okay, so the first business challenge that we encountered, which everybody, I mean, most of us encountered was, of course, the lockdowns and the quarantine tiers. And then supply shortage, manpower, HR issues, and delays in growth plans. So can you just imagine a three-year-old company during this time having all of these problems? And um, I, was, I wasn't in my 30s yet at that time. So based on experience, it's really different you know, when you start the company when you're more experienced than when you're in your 20s. Okay, so next slide, please. So this is, this first challenge is something that I'm sure everybody can relate, the lockdowns and quarantine tiers. So before we, um, when we started in 2016, um, one of our challenges of a new company is um, resources. At that, that time, we really wanted to make a big or bold move to, to move from a 20 square meter office to a um, 100 square meter office and then to a 200 square meter office. And then before the lockdown in 2019, my husband and I decided to move to a bigger space, to a 1,000 square meter space for us to um, expand more. So it was a blessing also that we were able to move all of our things and settle in our new office, new headquarters early in 2020. To be exact, that was um, February 2020. So can you imagine during the lockdowns in March March 16 or March 5, 14, um, we were already settled in our new office. So it was really the perfect timing for us to have enough space for everybody to accommodate a lot of our, a lot of our employees. So at that time, during the lockdowns and quarantine tiers, um, we didn't have really that much choices to, to make. But for us, for me and my husband, we saw that as an opportunity to grow and really work harder. Um, we have a, we have a two-year-old at that time, and we felt that it was really the perfect opportunity to, to really be good stewards of what we have. But this is what we have right now. So we have to work harder and even be a good role model to our employees that the pandemic shouldn't stop us to work hard. And the more we have to work harder. So we saw that as an opportunity to grow, work harder, and the strategy that we made was to create our own bubble 
as I said, we moved to a 1,000 square meter office with our, with our employees and all of our stocks. So we made use of that big space to provide shelter for our employees and also at the same time, allow them to um, give them the, the chance to stay in if they want to continue work. Because we also want to make sure that we abide in all the IATF rules and um, make sure that our company follows the rules of the government. So we created our own bubble, still continued operation. Uh, we never stopped. I would say uh, we never stopped. We never stopped working. And by still following all the rules and regulations, and we didn't accept any walk-ins or any customers. And yeah, so we created our own little bubble in our office. And for us, the strength was... To, to really be to move quick and decide quick so agility is one of the abilities that we had to we had at that time so we provided shelter but at the same time we also gave financial support to our employees so it doesn't mean that we provided work that's it so we tried to really extend all the possible financial aid that we could give until you know things get back to normal which was we know it was really not that easy and it wasn't that fast uh, quick as expected. So we gave financial support to everybody and um, the outcome of all the hard work in how many months, I would say, in the whole 2020 was we increased in sales, not only doubled, but I would say we tripled the sales during that time. Okay, so next slide, please. Another challenge would be um, supply shortage. So since we make the decisions, me and my husband, so we use this, we use this opportunity to really strengthen um, our company. Since we are a new company, we didn't want the pandemic to stop us from growing. So we made sure that we were resourceful, flexible, and still agile despite the pandemic. So from photography and camera accessories back in 2016, um, there was no demand during the pandemic, not at all. You know, um, nobody would want to um, take photos as a hobby at that time where people are really saving on their money, saving on cash. So we explored and opened ourselves to new opportunities and um, by exploring new categories. And one of the challenges actually at that time was our suppliers locally, both locally and um, our foreign suppliers. So most of them in China and in other countries, all were experiencing um, understaffed, skeletal manpower, and poor sales. So since that wasn't our problem, <clears throat> we wanted to strengthen that relationship with their partner brands and suppliers to continue their businesses through our business. We made sure that we stocked on products, we bought their supplies, we didn't make them feel that it was the pandemic. Um, most of them were understaffed, but they went to the office because of us, because we had so many orders from them. And we helped them continue their business. One of our local partner brands, um, one of the camera brands here in the Philippines, their sales really went up because we tried to push their products despite the pandemic. And for us, that was uh, new opportunities because from, from few brands, we explored and we really strengthened that relationship with the with the trusted brands here in the country and even the foreign brands. So we were, the result was we were able to explore new categories and a lot of products were unlocked because we didn't limit ourselves to just camera accessories, which we used to have years ago. Next slide, please. Okay, so another challenge for um, yeah, for our company was manpower and HR issues. So even if um, it's given that we're understaffed and even if we offered a place for them to stay, we offered the shelter, we offered a lot of things to our staff, attendance was still very inconsistent. One of the challenges, sorry, but one of the challenges because of Lala Move and Grab, um, it's because they offered a lot of... Um, um, great sidelines and um, beneficial for a lot of employees who had their own vans, cars, or motorcycles. So some of the employees chose to, to 
do lala move instead of going to work and sacrificing their attendance, which we understand. So a lot, one of the challenges was also the opportunity to sell online. So some of our staff um, sold um, to yo or um, a lot of food, a lot of food online. And they chose to do that instead of going to work, even if we didn't have any skeletal work and we also their salary wasn't also affected but they saw the opportunity that that would be better than going to work or going staying in our office so what did we do what we did was we still continued with our own bubble so we offered financial aid incentives incentives still business as usual um those who wanted to stay, they're very welcome. Those who didn't want to stay, it's okay. We understand. We extended that help to them. But also, one of the things that we added was we implemented programs to inspire and keep the environment happy. So our HR programs was really strengthened and was really um, utilized during this time. So speaking of HR activities, so despite the pandemic we're very grateful that we still had um a team building well we still followed all of the iatf rules so we we made sure that these were all allowed and the employees are um we also encourage everybody to get vaccinated and even um help them with all their medical needs and assisted them so yeah, we still continue to have fun and be happy at work and because we know how important mental health is that is also important for HR side to make sure that the employees were um, still healthy mentally. Okay, next slide, please. So just to show you how we work during the pandemic, this is a short video. So thank you. So that happened during the pandemic and we are grateful that our staff are still, most of our employees um, are still here and, and we are continuously growing. So today, JG Superstore from Juan Gadget. We okay, so hello. Uh, yeah, so um, from Juan Gadget, we rebranded to G4 products 2016. So, hell yeah, 2020. Now, in the data in 2020, so meaning the commerce channels, and you can readily order them and buy from them from us. They're readily available. And we also started from less than 20 brands. Um, these 20 brands, we made sure that. It's either we are an official dealer or we are an official distributor of these brands. And now we have over 150 plus trusted brands under, under JG Superstore. 
And also now, um, we have stronger operations to support both corporate and retail sales. So, and we, so we also strive to make sure that our corporate sales are also well-maintained and expand to that department. Next slide, please. So these are our trusted brands. Um, I don't think this is updated for 2022, but for 2021, these are our brands. And if you are familiar, if you are techie or into photography, um, music, and computers, some brands might be familiar to you. Okay, next slide, please. So we are also grateful that during the pandemic, both in 2020 and in 2021, we were recognized by Lazada Awards as the best in electronics accessories. So I think um, during this award, it's not just about sales, it's about a holistic approach when it comes to e-commerce. And also, it, um, just to share also, in 2016, we had a small store in San Juan, um, but because of 2020 pandemic, it just sealed the, our decision to focus on e-commerce and really strengthen our presence since we want to professionalize how e-commerce works in the Philippines. And thankfully, with the help of a lot of e-commerce platforms, we are able to do that also and um, pioneer when it comes to electronic accessories in the country. So here are some of our partner influencers and celebrities who also enjoyed using our products, especially during the time of lockdowns where, you know, most of them did their own content creations at home, TikToks, vlogging, and so many fun things that they had to entertain themselves at home. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our mission. We make, um, this is not only my mission or my husband's mission. At work, we make sure that all of us are, this is in our hearts, that we are on a mission not only to sell or to do business, but we are on a mission to empower Filipinos one gadget at a time. Thank you so much. Um, that's my short presentation. I hope I, hope I was able to um, inspire you or learn something from my baby, my first baby. Thank you. Thank you very much, JL, for allowing us to know more about your company, one of the companies which thrived during the pandemic. Thank you very much, JL. So we will now ha uh, we will have our open forum shortly. You can still send in your questions on the chat box or the Q&A box. But now we will hear from our reactor, one of the most respected figures in Philippine supply chain, she is currently Executive Director of the Supply Chain Management Association of the Philippines and served as its president for a combined nine years. She is also President and Chief Executive Officer of XPC Logistics and held stints in the likes of San Miguel and Coca-Cola. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Cora Kurai. Good afternoon. To everyone watching us today, it is an honor to be part of this event, the second in this partnership between ISIMAP and OPA Fund. My privilege to be with these two young, beautiful, passionate, accomplished women leaders like uh, Ms. Dana Maharokon and Ms. Jill Tan. Thank you, ladies, for sharing your time and your fresh and interesting uh, your innovation intervention during the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, I made some notes let me see, of uh, like for Lala Move Dana I was surprised that you have 70% are women in your workforce and you have 100 200,000 drivers partner drivers and uh, your innovation. Yung partner drivers na 200,000. I I heard uh, Jill complaining or not really complaining, but testing that they have uh, difficulty getting drivers. 
And uh, for our, I would also manifest that we are finding difficulty getting drivers for our small fleet. So <laughs> many of these drivers are with you. <laughs> it's just a ano lang yan, uh, lighting up. So you have uh, this uh, innovation of walking distance, go the distance, pushing boundaries. Let's say, let's say, you know, and uh, you thrive and grow like uh, Jill. I'm, I can relate to Jill having this, uh, this, having his own business, a family business and uh, having the shares of struggles and difficulties. We can relate that, especially if you're uh, new, but it's inspiring that you thrive and grow uh, you survive and grow during the pandemic. I know there were, uh, you had difficulty, especially competing with the big players with more resources and deeper pockets. And uh, you had the opportunity to grow uh, and create your own bubble. You survive and thrive during the lockdowns uh, your strategy for the supply shortage, for the manpower. Uh, so it's inspiring. And you now have 7,000 SQs. I can just imagine uh, we also manage a warehouse, a warehouse having this many SQs. But I think we, in your case, uh, it's through drop shipping. So it's not a lot of issue warehousing them. And uh, again, uh, there's a, you know, there's an article that I came across and I'm inclined to believe uh, this is about successful companies sauce or the secrets to the success of a business are the women, the women's support and the women leaders. So, well, they say that women provide different perspective and that feminine touch in the business. Yung nandito ngayon, agree ba kayo? Kung agree kayo, pwedeng i-type yung agree sa chat box. So, uh, so nakatype na kayo? Agree ba kayo? Many of you agree? <laughs> Agreed. Okay, so uh, listening also to Dana and Jill has reminded me of my experiences and my leadership journey through the, throughout the years in supply chain. And uh, unlike Dana and Jill, they have fast ch changing digital world. It was a different world for me back then. We don't have mobile phone. Oh, smartphone na nga ngayon. What we have was the bulky static phone na di na dial pa. I don't know kung may na, naabutan nyo. Kung, kung naabutan nyo, uh, ito yung mga baby boomers. So kung pwede kang mag-type ng yes, naabutan mo para naman may kasama ako. <laughs> Nakasama sa mga baby boomers. Ang and those times we there was no internet well you cannot uh there's no social media no no facebook no linkedin and whatever so none life and business back then was simple and slow and they came from a small town in bohol and the life there was even slower so aware of my limitation i need to work harder than the others so so ang ano noon I actually began my career with San Miguel Corporation as purchasing analyst. That was my early exposure to supply chain management. And I feeling years with Coca-Cola in the area also of supply chain management in materials, purchasing, transport, and logistics. So before I ventured into my own company and founded XBC Logistics and we realize that the, we need technology for us to survive. So uh, my son, Carlo, co-founded a technology startup. Uh, it's Insight SCS, Insight uh, 
a supply chain solution. Solution for, no, it's a one single platform. Uh, so it's a, uh, that's, that's the innovation what we did. So ang, ang ano noon is throughout these many years, I have witnessed how supply chain has evolved from its origins as several different disciplines as, as uh, I mentioned earlier, transportation, materials management, to its standing now as an important and critical element of any competitive business. I have also witnessed how the profession has constantly, constantly stepped up to serve businesses, large and small. and customers and how it has contributed to our economic development. Supply chain has long been not just about moving goods. Supply chain is your entire business from connecting with suppliers and partners to producing and delivering products that will provide more value, not just to your customers, but to your business as well. And especially in these times of interconnected global is facing numerous disruptions, especially the past two years. A world-class supply chain is essential in keeping businesses competitive and elevating the quality of life of everyone involved. And as such, it is important that all players continue to work together to realize common goals and achieve common benefits. And for these many years, I have also had the privilege to be part of the Supply Chain Management Association of the Philippines, one of the prime movers of the country's supply chain, chain sector. And uh, I'm privileged to serve as multi-term president, as mentioned by Ochi, nine, uh, so <laughs> nine as president and three years as executive director. And all this for the love of ISIMAP and Ikanga para sa bayan. So in the early years of my term as president, I'm, I met a strong advocate for policy reforms in the government who became an ally and a good friend of EasyMap for about two decades already. And this is no other than my dear friend, Dr. Henry Basilio. And throughout the years, we have witnessed the many challenges the sector has had to overcome. The increasing UG6 charges, onerous regulations and attempts at establishing monopolies and other systems that will drive up costs and impact our competitiveness. On the other hand, you have evolving customer preferences, the rise of the digital economy, just like mentioned by Lala, the, continu Lala move. the continuing concern of our supply chain capacity and capability and our role in ensuring the survival of this plan. I have learned the hard way that the best way to address these challenges and the best way to ensure the continued competitiveness of Philippine supply chain and Philippine business is to extend our hands to partners and stakeholders and expand our collaboration. Throughout the years, tackling various supply chain issues, I can say that without the help of Dr. Henry, the DTI and that of our members and other stakeholders, Philippine supply chain would be bogged down by counterproductive and inefficient regulations, rendering businesses unable to quickly respond to the fast pace of change. Our economy would probably be much worse off at the onset of COVID-19 and sure, there is still a lot of work to do, but without collaboration, we would need to cover much more ground. But this afternoon, we put the spotlight, uh, the important role of women in the supply chain and logistics sector on how supply chain empowers women and entrepreneurs and business leaders to go further. Female is not a new thing in our supply chain sector. We have a lot of uh, women leaders uh, in the Philippine logistics industry, but it is great nonetheless to see women continue to shatter the glass ceiling 
and assume leadership roles, both on big businesses and their own small enterprises. As our economy begins to roar back and women continue to find their place at the helm, our role in the supply chain sector is to continue reaching out to them, listening to their concerns and working with them to ensure that they can transform the opportunities in front of them into a better life for their families and loved ones, their employees and partners, and for the country as a whole. Collectively, as supply chain leaders, we can make this happen. And we are in this together. Thank you. Back to you, Ochi. Thank you very much, uh, Cora, yeah. for your insights and perspectives on the role of women in supply chain. And uh, now we go on to our open forum. Um, may I invite uh, Ms. Dana and Ms. Chill to join us. And Ms. Cora, please also stay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> some okay. Questions, okay. Okay. So this first question is for Ms. Dana. So it was mentioned that 70% of um, women in Lala Move uh, are women in Lala Move. How, what is this number, you 70%? Well, you know, we actually have almost 400 um, team members mm. in the Lalamu family. Um, and as mentioned, um, over 70% of them are women. In our management team alone, the same ratio applies. Yeah. Mm. Very good. Thank you very much. So um, I'd like to ask both Jill and Dana and Ms. Cora also. So we see a lot of women leaders in businesses, logistics, and supply chain, especially in the Philippines. So what are the skills unique to women that makes them perfect leaders in this industry? Your thoughts, please. I'd like to go first. <laughs> sorry, would you mind repeating your question? You kind of okay, sorry. for a little bit. Okay. So we see a lot of women leaders in businesses, supply chain, and logistics. So what are the skills unique to women that makes them perfect leaders in the industry? Would you like to share your thoughts? Okay, Ms. Dana. Sure. Um, well, you know, first and foremost, I, I am truly a firm believer of um, creating uh, opportunities for the people within companies. Um, I think uh, one of the key traits that women leaders have is continuing to pave the way for more people to rise above, right? Um, given that up until recently, the openness to having women in, you know, management positions or women in key roles was something that people really had to work very, very hard to get to. I think once women finally reached that stage, it allowed them to um, try to make it uh, more accessible and easier for people to achieve. But it's not just a matter of creating that kind of avenue for people or making it easy, so to speak, but rather being very purposeful in how they train, they mold, they mentor people in order for them to have less of a challenge in rising above. Um, and I think that's very important, not just for future women leaders, because of course, as a woman leader, you don't only choose future women leaders as well. The idea there is for you to be able to create that stage for everyone to shine. And because of that, that kind of mindset, you are able to create stronger leaders that ultimately continue to grow the company and um, ultimately allow the company to be able to progress and be, be more future proof, so to speak, you know, your future successors, your future leaders, regardless of gender, regardless of race, um, this is not something that now has become a barrier, but rather you continue to create that stage for everyone to shine. And I think that's very, very important in order for companies to continue to grow. Okay, thank you, Dana. Ms. Jill? Yeah, for me, I don't think it's just about being a woman, but um, in my experience also, I wear many hats, not just a business owner, but I'm also a mom of two boys and I'm also a wife. So one of the things that I, think, I believe God designed us women is he gave us, us the power to, to, to wear many hats and be very flexible 
in many things. You know, as a mom, even if you're in the office, you still think of your kids. You still think of your household. You just you think of um, the things at home, not only in the office. And that's one of the important things also that I'm able to impart in the office that my purpose is not only here as the business owner, but I try my best to also have compassion as a woman that, you know, I'm not saying that men are not compassionate, but this is, um, women are more compassionate and we are designed that way. So when we make decisions, me and my husband, um, my perspective as a woman, his perspective as a man, it really blends perfectly because we are both very open and transparent to each other and we listen very well and communicate to what both men and women need. And as I mentioned again, as a mom also, it helps me to make decisions for my employees. Not It's not just about business, that you have the heart for them. You care for them because as a mom, you have that, you know, that extra heart for not just for, for work, but you add so much purpose to what you do. Thank you. Miss yeah. <clears throat> huh? Cora? Yeah, uh, in addition to what uh, Dana and Jill mentioned, uh, yes, I agree that women have the, to do multitasking. They, are, uh, they have empathy, they are more compassionate, and they, know how they balance uh, career and family. And... Uh, to make them successful in business, you ha they have to have that uh, grit. They have to have perseverance, patience, and and to be tough as needed, right? and uh, have the courage. So, uh, and during this time, women must also be resilient, and women. Uh, many have proven and many, in fact, uh, our two, our two uh, speakers here have proven that uh, they are resilient that uh, for the continuity of the business. So uh, that is their competitive differentiator uh, during this uh, pandemic, not only, but, uh, not only during this pandemic, but beyond. So thank you. Thank you, Cora. So we have another question here. So this is for Dana. How can Lalamu continue to become competitive and offer promos despite the few increases? What do you attribute this to? Um, well, you know, we, we do continue to provide uh, affordable and reliable services to our MSMEs and consumers alike. Uh, one of the main reasons why we do promos is actually to promote trial for people, right? So foundationally, uh, the pricing model that we have is actually the most competitive in the market. It's, I would even have to say, the lowest price um, in the market. And um, the promos that we have, um, if you will notice... Um, um, usually promote a certain type of behavior. For example, um, we would like to encourage our um, online sellers to book multiple orders, multiple stops in order for them to avail of particular promos. The more you book, the more discounts you get. Again, uh, with the objective of continuing to promote uh, frequency of deliveries. Um, Apart from you know promos, this is something that um, that I think is uh, what will help Lala move really continue to stay at the top of its game is for us to continue to provide relevant services to the market. So starting with motorcycles, which was you know something that people thought was a luxury to have on demand delivery, you know some five years ago. Now it's something that people will think that okay, I'm gonna get a Lala move later, right? It's such a norm for you to say a Lala move it to you. Right. And we want to continue with that by providing new vehicle types that people can find relevant to whatever form or need, most especially that businesses may have. So hence the introduction of smaller um, four wheel vehicles, larger uh, vehicles in the form of small trucks, medium all the way to six wheeler vehicles. And, you know, we don't intend on stopping there uh, in the near future. Um, you will be able to see even more vehicle types um, that will allow you to suit whatever need you may have. You know, whether it's first, 
mid or last mile delivery. You can use any of the vehicles that we have here in Lala Move. Okay, looking forward to more vehicle types serving our customers, Anna. Thank you. So I'd like to ask Ms. Jill. Uh, you mentioned a lot of suppliers no, in your, or uh, those offering their products and those which you sell online. So how do you manage to keep all the suppliers? Um, of course, you have to negotiate with a lot of them. Uh, what are your strategies uh, in, in order to um, have these suppliers under your watch or under still under you? Well, we know that it's really difficult to acquire um, hundreds of brands. And as actually Ms. Cora said, um, we, we are not actually doing drop shipping. Most of the products are in our warehouse. So we make sure that we have a strong, uh, we have system, a reliable system, reliable operations to make sure that um, we avoid these challenges, you know, avoid a lot of um, problems when it comes to shipping, when it comes to after sales. And I also forgot to mention that we also take care of after sales. So it's not only about selling. So we take care of from start to end process. So we make sure that all of our electronic products have warranty. So yeah, we take care of that. We strengthen our technical department. And yeah, to be able to manage these brands, um, I don't have a single answer because it's a very tough <laughs> challenge. Every day, day to day, we have many challenges per brand. But one thing we learned is to really strengthen our people, strengthen our employees, choose the right people who will help us because me and my husband cannot do it alone anymore. You know, we started five years ago. We can do everything. But now we have um, more than 50 employees. I don't know the exact number, but we have um, several departments already handling different, um, different departments in technical, even managing content of our, all of our e-commerce posts. Uh, we have um, design team, customer service, one of the most important um, departments and several other departments to be able to manage these brands. And we, because of our strategy to not stop working during the pandemic, this also allowed not, um, th this allowed more brands to come to us and um, use our channel, use our platform to be able to market their own brands. So now we are more picky. We are more um, careful in choosing the brands and making sure that the brands that we choose, that we carry, are really brands that will not um, cause any after-sales problem and will also be very supportive of our, of our brand image to make sure that the Filipinos... We, we are able to empower the Filipinos through our products, through our electronic products. I hope I was able to answer the question. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Gia. So we have a question for our three panelists. What is your forecast on the supply chain industry post-pandemic? Are there any um, plans for your company to further thrive in the years to come? Ms. Cora, you can start. Uh, forecast. To try beyond, beyond post, uh, it's a post pandemic. So we have to, even now, and uh, to prepare for the post pandemic, we have to have this uh, innovation. We have to be innovated and uh, for us to survive. So it, this, uh, this is uh, the way to go. Innovation is and the technology is uh, required uh, in the business. So we have to embrace technology, although this has been accelerated during the pandemic. So, uh, and now we are more prepared. I think uh, many of the companies now, in fact, SMEs, uh, I heard from one of uh, one of the webinars that SMEs now have embraced many of them. Uh, more than fifty percent already have embraced uh, technology. So 
with that uh, and with this uh, the economy is growing and uh, even with uh, we're hoping that after the election it would still the economy would perk up and uh, the winds that we have right now uh, can can uh, can still be uh, continued so and with since after the lockdown or now that is we are now alert, uh, alert level one we many of the filipinos many of us wanted to go out in fact malls are already crowded so so that will perk up the economy perk up the consumption so we can expect uh, higher gdp and higher uh, better economy so so that would be my <laughs> better especially for the digital <laughs> digital uh, businesses especially lala move <laughs> lala move and and jill here even post pandemic there will still be online selling and there will still be more more deliveries uh, Okay, thank you, Cora. Ms. Dana? You know, taking a leaf off of, um, off of what Cora mentioned earlier, I think um, a lot of the companies, MSMEs and um, even enterprises alike have already started embracing technology. And the beauty of that is that in the midst of the pandemic, it really allowed businesses to still survive, right? Now that we are in the post-pandemic, so to speak, era, um, I know we still have the pandemic in place, but people are really managing and businesses are managing to adapt, right? But um, for the past two years, a lot of businesses have been functioning fully online. And now that the economy is reopening, now that businesses are now back in their uh, premises and their brick and mortar um, locations, they now have two channels, online and offline. Um, and this is only going to continue to grow their own business, whether you're in retail, whether you're in f &B or whatever industry you may be in. But the nice thing about being in the supply chain or being smack in the middle of the movement of all of that is that if they need to move goods from selling online to last mile deliveries, deliveries are there. If you need to move goods from your warehouse to your branches, deliveries are still going to be there. When you want your raw materials to be produced and delivered to your warehouses, deliveries are still going to be there. So with the economy reopening and with the demand of consumers and businesses alike also growing, you know, um, logistics companies being in the middle of it all will just continue to grow even bigger. Um, so it is the pressure is on us, um, technology, logistics, supply chain companies to be able to move much, much faster than we've ever done before in order to keep up. Because two years ago, we had to deal with the surge of online. And now we're combating with both online and offline surge in delivery. So this is something that um, it's a beautiful place to be in, honestly. But this is also going to be a, a new challenge for all of us. Thank you, Dana. It's Jill. Um, for me, I think one of the one of the secrets or maybe one of the strategies what we did was to really plan one step ahead and to really grow very quick and very fast. Five years ago, we didn't plan to have a pandemic, but how we are operating now is something that we planned five years ago. So when the pandemic came, it wasn't really a big adjustment for our operations or for our people. It was business as usual because we have been doing that. Uh, three years ago before the pandemic started. So now that we are, so to speak, post-pandemic, we are, one of our um, strategies or decisions is to really think ahead and plan ahead what will happen five years from now because we cannot plan for just the year or for the next year, but we have to plan for five years what is going to happen and how do we do that? We educate ourselves on what's happening in other countries and that's something that really helped me and my husband decide on, on our direction when we started the company we already had so many um, business models in mind that are not yet here in the Philippines. And thankfully, um, the business model is not perfect, but it has been working in other countries like in China, in the US, and it's still in line with what's happening now. So speaking of online and offline, um, 
offline is already very feasible because it has been done for decades and decades and online is not something that many companies can easily adjust to so since we are strong in this part we will just keep on strengthening ourselves and just keep on um, growing quickly and growing faster so that we are able to support the supply chain and as i mentioned also during my talk it was one of the reasons why we're able to continue the business of many local brands in the country and they're able to maintain their brands in the Philippines because we're able to support them through our platform. And it's not easy, but, you know, we are, I am at the peak of my age to work and like my husband, so we won't waste time and just keep on continue doing what we are doing right now. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question. How can the government best support your business as we enter the so-called new normal? <laughs> Any thoughts? Well, honestly, I think that's such a that's a very very broad question. There, are, um, if you ask me, how can the government help businesses during the new normal? There are a lot of things I can probably give you a list of a hundred at the bare minimum. But maybe I'll I'll center it back in what we do, uh, which is on demand deliveries. I think that um, uh, on demand deliveries technology. I think that um, uh, there are still a lot of uncertainties surrounding regulation surrounding. Um, um, how uh, platforms are managed. And, um, but, but the good news is the conversations with the relevant government agencies are already happening. Anything new naman. Uh, any new industry uh, begs for clearer understanding, further study. Um, we saw this, uh, we saw the disruption of e-commerce some 10 years ago where nobody knew or nobody truly understood it. Um, and, you know, now here, uh, e-commerce is definitely supported by, by varying policies, etc. So I think for on-demand deliveries or for platforms in general, this is something we're already in the middle of all of the relevant conversations that need to happen in order for this to uh, really progress. Um, it's good that we are having these. Um, I think it's just really a matter of, you know, now policy making and policy implementation. Uh, some topics surrounding that would be how do we manage um, how um, how we are able to accept and manage um, uh, uh, MSMEs into the platform so that we are best uh, we are able to support them? How uh, how do we manage the onboarding and the offboarding of partner drivers so that we can open our doors even further to accept more of them? When you go city to city, region to region, there are also varying policies. So it's, I think it's really just a matter of time where a better or a more unified understanding as to how the industry really moves um, will allow uh, varying government agencies to create really create one consolidated policy surrounding this. Okay, thank you, Dana. Any thoughts, Ms. Jill? I think Dana said that <laughs> said it all because you know I'm sure if we have time to talk about what can the government do or what policies I'm sure there would be so many things we could say but um for a business owner I guess we just have to uh, um what I guess uh, when we started um we started the business um there were many loopholes when it comes to filing taxes online but for us we didn't um that wasn't a problem because we made sure that we registered our business from the very start. We wanted to professionalize our business and we wanted to change the online, you know, notion or landscape. When they say online, I online business lang yan or posting lang on Facebook. So we changed that. So I guess from our perspective, we made sure that we professionalized everything and we are aware of, you know, of all the, of how to run the business, even aware, making sure that we know how to take care of our employees how to take care of um, managing our taxes and all of these things that whether you're online or offline, you are still doing the business the right way. So I guess I couldn't say anything. It's a very vague question. <laughs> so maybe um, more experts can answer that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's all the questions we have. 
So thank you once again to our speakers for this afternoon. Dana Maharokon of Lala Move, Jill Tan of JG Superstore, and Ms. Cora Kuroi, our actor from SMAP. We'd also like to thank our audience for joining us this afternoon. So this wraps up another edition of SMAP Live Innovation Spotlight on women in supply chain. We will have more events in the coming months and you will keep up to date by visiting our website, sumap.org, as well as following us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Special thanks to uh, UPAF Respond for uh, joining us and helping us our, to organize this afternoon's program. For now, I am Ana Rose Ochoa, and on behalf of everyone, SMAP and UPAF Respond, I'd like to wish you a pleasant day ahead Let's keep supply chain moving. God bless.